Hey everyone, Monique Dusan here. I'm Krista Bontrager. And we are the Center for Biblical Unity, kind of together, you know? <laughs> That's what they tell us anyway. <laughs> Every month, we seek to put out content that's just for you as a way to say thank you for your support and your prayers. Your support has made it possible for me to stop working full time and work full time for the Center for Biblical Unity. And, you know, we just really want to say thank you. Um, Today, we are going to talk about an article or not even an article. Maybe it was an article, but it was something from the Smithsonian. (laughs) Don't judge us. This is going to be the no makeup. We're just going to play it as we go along yeah. edition but the we got no script no script this is freestyle no you guys when i say we are family we are just gonna have a family conversation <laughs> just us just the cousins okay yeah. just because like we like the first cousins yeah okay so the smithsonian institute this week or last week last week yeah put out a article so well to it speak, was a new it was a portal yeah it was a portal uh from the african-american museum mm-hmm. which is part of the group of Smithsonian yes. museums and they wanted to put up this portal to encourage conversation about race. In fact, we have a little link here uh, to the website. You can go check about, check it out. It's called talking about race and you can go in there and see all the definitions about whiteness. And um, you know, we'll just scroll through this real quick here. You can see white privilege has a, has a discussion and a section and the famous Peggy McIntosh, uh, article there about the unpacking the knapsack of privilege, Robin D'Angelo video, what site on whiteness wouldn't be complete without Robin D'Angelo. Uh, we'll keep going. White dominant culture, white supremacy, all these things, all this stuff. Well, part of this, interestingly oh, enough, hooks. <laughs> part of this included an infographic describing whiteness whiteness yes you you shouldn't but, really put so much <laughs> emphasis on your w's it's a little odd it's, but yeah yeah it's so the, culture, the infographic but the infographic only lasted a couple of days and then, and then and then it was pulled down yeah yeah so it's been a little scrubbed but you know the internet has its way of preserving things yes so yes, we it have does. it you can find anything on the internet <laughs> aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. Okay, so these things are, or would be, I guess, considered white um, ideals or aspects that would be considered part of white culture. Um, And I'm putting those things in air quotes because, you know, I don't personally see these things as just being um, associated with the white culture. Um, or the, you know, European culture or anything like that. But what I could, what I would say is that a lot of these things are, or at least for rugged individualism, when we look at cultures that are more communal versus more individualistic, Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a lot of minority cultures are more communal. Mm -hmm. And so things like self-reliance while there are some aspects of self-reliance, like you do need to do your fair share, it is it is a communal effort mm-hmm. to move forward. Yeah. So what what would what are your thoughts on? I think that you know just in my own experience in growing up in a you know pretty strong Protestant white context, I would say the value of effort, self-reliance, individualism was definitely something that was was part of my upbringing it's but there was also a concept of when i was a child growing up of what we called citizenship which was that we were part of something bigger than just ourselves and then we had an obligation to be good citizens it's not really something that you hear talked about so much anymore but this was this was definitely more of a value when i was growing up is that it wasn't individualism for the sake of like it's only about me. It was I act as part of a good citizen in my country and I want to do things that reflect good on my country, that reflect good on my family. But I think kind of the individualism comes first in that if I'm born into a, a, a difficult family situation, I can rise above it as an mm. individual. And so there was, there was that, that aspect to it. 
Yeah, I think in um in my travels and doing work overseas, especially in in South Africa and Zambia, you see a a, a mindset that is extremely co- um, tribal mm-hmm. or extremely um, communal. Where if one is going to do good, we all must do good. And where where one experiences pain, everyone experiences pain. And so I I mean, there are parts of that that I think are beautiful. You know, I think that sure. that the rally around the, the individual and the rally around the family and the tribe um, to lift each other up is something that we could use a little bit more of here in the States as opposed to this, you know, it's it's only me and mine. But I think on the opposite side of that is that when it's only communal or when it's so heavily communal, then we do miss the opportunity to say, hey, no, you can you can actually go and do this. You don't have to wait for the agreement of the tribe. You don't have to wait yeah. for the agreement of the community before you step out to do something. And I don't know that I personally see that in like all minority cultures, I don't see that in a lot of, in or so heavily anymore in black culture. You know, like I see people going and, and following their own dreams. And it's a, a big narrative that we should go out and pursue our own dreams and not just be, you know, stuck at home or stuck with the family. Yeah. I think from a biblical perspective, we see both. I think that the Bible offers a correction to both of those paradigms. We see in the, the, the imagery of the body of Christ or us as being family, um, that's definitely a more group-oriented identity. And yet Christ calls us as individuals to come to him. We aren't saved through our parents. He says, unless you, you know, who is my father, my mother, my brothers? It's, it's who the person is, is that has that unity with him. As an individual, we don't get saved by our ethnicity. We don't get saved by our tribe. We don't get saved by our parents. Even. Yeah. So to me, scripture, if I was going to look at that from a biblical point of view, we, we have to have balance between both. Scripture speaks into both of those paradigms and offers a correction. That's so, good. I, yeah. I appreciate that. I just, um, I wouldn't necessarily consider um, being an individual and working hard, something that is white. Yeah. Um, I think that those are things that the Bible affirms all people to do. Well, let's get into that because yeah. I think work is going to show up here in a minute. Family structure, nuclear family, father, mother, 2.3 children is the ideal social unit. Well, I don't know how you get a point third of a child, yeah. but you know. <laughs> I don't know. Averages? I don't know. Uh, husband's breadwinner, wife is the homemaker. Uh, subordinate to the husband, children have their own rooms and they are independent. This is so peculiar yeah. to me. Well, I, th- I, I mean, ahead, there's a, there's a part of this that sure we as Christians affirm, like the nuclear family. That's the God. It's not the ideal social unit. It's God's ideal. It's the way mm-hmm. He created things. But to say that like, children should have their own rooms and be independent that's so peculiar to me. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't even know where that comes from. I, yeah, that, I don't that just either. looks I, like a stereotype. <laughs> you know? I, some people want their own. You know, one of the things I want to focus on, though, is this idea of the nuclear family and why I come out so strong against Black Lives Matter. Because the nuclear family is God's ideal for family, a uh, husband, a wife children father mother children and and that's not to devalue single people no it's not to devalue yeah, them yeah, at but all just if we're gonna have a family this is this what is it, what it lo- looks like it this was like. his ideal right again the word yeah. the word ideal to me is what's integral there is that this was his ideal for family and uh, no it's not you know if you're a single mother or a single father or something like that that you know there's any devaluing or anything like that it's just um when we look at scripture this is his his plan yeah for what family should look like and um, what Black Lives Matter seeks to do is is really to kind of get rid of that. You know, they don't have an ideal for the black family. Or the black father. Or, or the black father. Yeah. You and, know what I mean? Black and, fatherhood is a major problem right now in the black community. Especially when there's like 70% of children being born to single mothers. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean that, that fathers aren't involved? Not necessarily. Right. No, but... The, the majority of children live with the mother. And there's a big problem of 
of fathers having children with multiple women. Yes. And it's, it's. Yeah. It, so it, I'm like, Black Lives Matter, if y'all gonna really speak into the whole situation of the black life and that's gonna matter, then let's speak into all of it, not just some of it. Well, and you being know? a child of a single parent dramatically increases your, the things Poverty that are, rate, gang yeah. activity. Um, lack of education, Your vulnerability, yeah, vulnerability to, to, to these things, to, these to, be, things. to become susceptible to these things. But that's where the beauty of the individualism comes in. Because in America, as an American value, or what they're calling a white value here, which I would disagree mm-hmm. with, is that you can actually break apart from that and you can transcend whatever situation you were born into. So you can be born in poverty in an inner city um, to... S- a, a parent who isn't educated and you can rise above that yes as an individual that is the beauty of of what's possible but you know yeah and again like this is a lot of the same things that i hear yeah. in the black community or in minority communities you know people wanting um better for their children better sure. than what they had and that's not something that when when parents seek for the betterment of their children that they are now considering, oh, well, I just want to be white today or I just want to, you know, have this European mindset for my child today. No, they want the best for their child. They want their child to do better than they did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's go on. So emphasis on scientific method, objective, rational, linear thinking, cause effect relationships, quantitative emphasis. I think this is a really interesting one because when you first came we had a lot of conversations where you would tell me I I only white people care about logic or that's white logic, mm. that's white theology, um, that's white thinking. And well, I don't use logic. That's not, you know, you know, that's how I've been trained. I didn't say I didn't use logic. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, to- people, I've come a long way. But to, to but really this this the the key point there I think is objective truth. There's mm-hmm. there's some things that are just true that there are, but we have gotten so far away from objective truth. But now if that's called white and white is associated with the oppressor, it's really hard to get to truth because yes. now everybody just has my truth. Yes. Which is really what we used to call opinion. Yeah. That's <laughs> or true. Your personal and- experience. Um, one of the things though, with this whole, with that whole, you know, like scientific method and things like that, it makes me think of that, um, the, all the things episode we did with Neil Shinvi and how CRT is coming into the STEM fields and what does that look like? Um, and in regards to the, um, idea of like objective truth and morality and all of that, and this now being considered, um, a white ideal um, I'm just wondering where do we find our objective truth now? Well, it really puts Christians at odds mm-hmm. with the people who affirm critical race theory or critical theory. It's like from the beginning, we're saying something very different about how the world is. If mm-hmm. there's objective truth versus subjective or my truth, mm-hmm. um, this is a, a foundational point that is utterly incompatible. They both yeah. cannot be the case yeah so it's going to put us at odds culturally with people around us it is yeah that's where the boldness and risks are going to have to come from yeah all right let's go on history based on northern european immigrants experience in the united states heavy focused on the british empire the primacy of western greek roman and judeo-christian tradition now when it comes to CRT and the augmentation of history, one of the things that I appreciate is that they seek to bring in more, um, more history from minorities within within the states and their experience, um, like slavery or um, Native, like Americans. Native American history and things like that. So I do appreciate that, but I don't know that that there is something like simply like all white history. I think we have American history and, you know, our founding fathers were white and, you know, we, we teach that in schools. I do think that augmenting or adding, you know, some, uh, some additional history to what we receive so that we can have a more fuller narrative is important. 
But it is also true that our country, it, the founding of our country is deeply connected to Judeo-Christian mm-hmm. principles and ideas, uh, particularly within Protestant Christianity. Their founding fathers, even though they may not have all been Christians, um, they they definitely were influenced by, by Judeo those ideals. by those ideals mm-hmm. and Judeo Christian ideals. I mean, even people up until fifty years ago, even thirty years ago, were largely their thoughts were largely shaped by that um, those ideas and and secular hum- humanists, you know, the classical liberals mm-hmm. still have. A, a lot in common with those Judeo-Christian values. It's it's definitely there, but now with the rise of critical theory, again, we're immediately at odds because, you know, it's it's going to lead us down two different paths yes. of what is good, true, and beautiful. And it's two different sets of assumptions, and there's going to lead us down two different paths. And that's where this gets scary to me, where you know, being white or white culture is, it is deeply connected in, in many regards to Judeo Christian worldview. The rise of critical theory is, I think, not just an, an assault on, on being white, it's an assault on being a, a Christian. Christian. Mm-hmm. So I think that is the first assault. I think that people will use um, this idea of attacking whiteness and things like that, attacking the, the Western European ideals. But in reality, the goal is to, is to do away with the Christian values. Yeah. All right, let's go on here. Protestant work ethic. Hard work is the key to success. Work before play. If you didn't meet your goals, you didn't work hard enough. Mm, I, I kind of feel like, you know, I learned like the proof is in the pudding, you know? So it's like if you if you have a goal and you want to accomplish something, if you accomplish it, then the proof is in the pudding. Like you put in the hard work, like you have to do it. We can't, we can't blame... Um, you know, and to me, this is what this sets up. It sets up a dichotomy where if I don't accomplish something, it's not because I didn't work hard enough. It's because I didn't, you know, participate as being white. Yeah. You know, but what does that mean? What does that open up? Like that just to me opens up a victim narrative and that's what it keeps there is, well, well, how do you get to the end? You well, know, and maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. Well, I think it does, again, set us up at odds um, as Christians because, I would say that the, what's called the Protestant work ethic is really just a, the outworking of a biblical principle of sowing and reaping. Mm-hmm. And if you look in the Proverbs, the Proverbs is just replete with scriptures about work. You don't work, you don't eat? You don't, well, yeah, that's the Apostle Paul's words in, okay, in one just, of the epistles. And, and yeah. it's, it's I'm just... I'm not a theologian, y'all, so Proverbs, but, Paul. <laughs> it's... It's important to understand that we were made to work as part of God's good created design yeah. in Genesis chapter 2. The man and the woman were created to work. Work is not a result of the fall, and neither is it a white value. Mm-hmm. It is a, a distinctly Judeo-Christian value, um, and that we have been designed to work, and that is the principle of sowing and reaping, even when... Uh, in God's law, where he makes a provision for the poor um, to be able to come glean the fields, they still had to come do the work. Yes, they still had to do the work. It wasn't that they could, you know, just go buy somebody's house and pick up the fruit that had already been picked for them. Right. No, it, there was a provision made, but that provision included work. Because work has dignity. Mm-hmm. And so to call that a white value and to say something is white is to say it's wicked, it's evil, yes. it's something to be to be um, opted out of if you're a person of color. Mm-hmm. I think that's a profoundly, um, it's just bad theology. And it really, again, well, I mean, it, is going against the Christian worldview. It's bad theology. And I mean, how hurtful and harmful is it to say that these things over here um, are now wicked because they're associated with being white? Like, we, we need to take time to actually sit and think about what we're saying before we hop on to a bandwagon that demeans, devalues, dehumanizes someone else because of the color of their skin. Yeah. 
So I did a couple of teachings on my YouTube channel. People might find helpful on a theology of work mm -hmm. and just understanding it from a from a biblical standpoint. So, you know, that would be a good kind of next step yeah. on this conversation. What's All right. next one? Religion. Christianity is the norm. Anything other than Judeo-Christian tradition is foreign. No tolerance for deviation from single God concepts. This is such, this is such loaded language mm -hmm. here. I mean... I just want to say next. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to comment on this because there's a difference between saying Christianity is a norm and Christianity has been the majority view. Mm -hmm. To me, those are different things. But it is a decidedly Christian value to have the First Amendment of freedom of religion. This is a deeply profound idea because in the Christian worldview, we don't believe in conversion by coercion. We don't believe that. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't hold to a state-sanctioned a state religion. So we allow people to worship in diversity. We are, and our country said, you know, we look in Scripture and we see that there's an allowance for worship, even false worship, mm -hmm. even deviant worship. Those people have protections. Yes. And so it's, it's offensive to me as a Christian to, to use such loaded language and to make it the setup be as if we're going to persecute or punish people for having a different religion. And on the flip side, I want to encourage Christians that, you know, if there's a, a house of worship in your neighborhood that is not Christian, it is, it is a profoundly American and I would say ultimately Christian ideal to so allow that. For freedom of worship, for yes. The wheat and the tares grow up together. Mm -hmm. God will sort it out at the judgment. And we protect the rights of minority religions because someday we might be the minority. Oh, someday I think we will be. And in other countries where Christians suffer persecution, it is because they are a minority religion. And so we of all people ought to protect mm -hmm. the the rights of minority religions to practice peaceably. Yes. Uh, and gather peaceably because we would want them to stand up for our rights. This was the whole idea of what makes Corey Ten Boom saving Jews in the Holocaust a yes. noble idea. She didn't save them because necessarily she thought, you know, like, well, we worship exactly the same way. She saved them because they had inherent dignity, value, and worth as fellow human persons. And that's what makes that a noble ideal. So, yes, that's a good word. Yeah. Let's see the next one. Yeah. All right. That is power and authority. Wealth oh equals worth. Your job is who you are. Respect and authority. Heavy value on ownership of good space and property. Okay, now I'm going to really yeah. go off. Well, yeah. you know, I feel like this This is interesting. I don't know that, I guess, f sitting in this seat now, I didn't, I guess at some point I did hold these things to, you know, be more white when I was into really heavily into CRT. But I, yeah, like, I don't know that n at any point did I, I guess, I don't know. I don't know how seriously I bought into that because I feel like I was always earning my own money. You know, I've been earning money since I was 16, yeah. you know, and, and, but, you know, my job is who I, who I was. I feel like that maybe I was living white and I didn't know. <laughs> but let's talk about this it. whole respect authority business. Why is respecting authority a white value? I mean, I, let's, know, let's, let's, I feel like you're going to put some respect on my name, put some spec on it. Put that, some spec on my name. To say that's a white value is to say that <laughs> well, we we can just act any kind of crazy well, way. I think this is where we get the whole idea of defund the police. That this idea of authority is a white idea. You know, and um, we need to debunk this idea that there has to be some kind of european authority figure authority format um and and we can do it different we can do it better we can govern ourselves but again look i'm all for self-governing i i think that's actually a very biblical idea um self-control is a, is a fruit of the spirit um 
but God has set up structures. He has set up you to govern yourself. He has set, set parents up to govern their children. He has set the, the church up to help govern us. The, and the state helps to govern us. These are the spheres that, mm-hmm. of authority that God has set up. Yeah. When we start talking about not respecting authority as yeah. a white value, again, what we're really saying is that the Christian worldview is coming into deep and profound conflict mm-hmm. with this this critical theory narrative. You know, from a, a more sociological standpoint, I wonder how all this is going to work. You know, if, <laughs> if, if police are defunded, you know, I wouldn't... They, they would have to really look hard to find me, you know, to send me in <laughs> as a still piece. Working like, in if I was still working in social service, you gonna have to look real good and hard to say, "Where Monique at? She need to go in and, and attend are you to gonna, these people." Are you gonna pull going. people over for traffic stops? No, I'm not going. No, you run that arms? red light. Well, bless. You better go and pray for y'all. Pray for your safety, because no, I'm I'm not the one. I'm not the one. Like we in social service, we will get police escorts to go and remove a child. You know, so who am I going to call if, if you're the social worker and now you are the People peace person, crazy and, you know, who do you call when yeah. you need backup? Who do you call when, when you have to do that police escort and now the father is getting crazy or, or you yeah. have to go and do that, that home visit. I'm sorry. And yeah. the father's getting crazy. I'm, do I call myself? Like, who do I call? <laughs> I ain't got nobody to call. You but know what or, happens to but, a culture when you don't have respect for authority as a, as a wide cultural value? Well, I think before we even get there, I think what we're seeing in a lot of um, in a lot of inner cities that are made up heavily by minority communities is that there isn't a lot of respect for authority in in some cases. I'll say that I'm not going to put out a blanket thing like ain't nobody got no respect. I'm not saying that, but there is what you find in poverty in poverty communities impoverished communities is more drugs more violence um more theft there's more need for for police involvement because of all of the things that run in the circle of the impoverished community and so what are you now doing by removing or defunding taking away the authority that would govern that area you know what do you do when someone breaks into the grandmother's home or what do you do when the grandmother who is raising her grandchild and this is something that's prevalent in in minority and impoverished communities you have the grandmother now raising the grandchildren that grandchild is now gone buck wild and is out of control who's she gonna call yeah you know like we we i understand the whole judeo christian um values and things like that but just let's talk about the real the real practicality of it when you decide you want to take away police and you know when i was growing up i would be the main one calling asking for help you know, you called 911 a few times. I called 911 a few times. And so now they're they're taking away the help that can establish law and order within a community. You know, we talk about the police as if every police officer is corrupt and bad. That isn't true. How do we, you know, say, hey, this is what we're going to work with then and build something up within other officers that says, you know what, this guy is crooked and we're going to have to, you know, have some real conversations. Yeah. How do we train officers to go into communities? And I think by and large, a lot of them do receive this training, you know, to go into communities, to begin establishing relationships despite color and all of that. How do you protect and serve? Right. You know, but that's what we need. We need people to protect and serve because gangs are still real. People are still getting shot now. So now, what? You, we have a gun shootout, and nobody's going to oh, come. You some ain't of sending our, me. Some of the inner cities are just being ravaged right yes, now. Yes, and they with- they want to send in the social service people. The devil is a lie. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you now. I don't even know what camera I'm supposed to look at, but I will tell you the devil is a lie. I will not be going. Yeah. All right. Let's go on. Um. Okay. You wanna- oh, I want to go back to that authority one for a minute. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about property rights and ownership this is one of the most devalued i think christian principles i really would like i'm working on a couple of blog post ideas right now about this because so many of the laws in the old testament presume property rights 
and they and the importance of property rights is a very important idea in scripture and you can't just take people's property yeah you can't steal people it's property stealing is one of the ten commandments you know you can't steal people or their property exactly yes. and it's just to to say that that is a white value yeah. and again we're associating a white value with being evil and wicked and plundering and these these very pejorative ideas it immediately puts us at odds again this is a clash of world views mm -hmm. this is not just a minor thing of like well we really want to help people no this is this is important worldview level conflict and people are jumping on board with it under the the banner of equity yeah under the banner of love my neighbor so now you i know? can steal yeah 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 like I, if i if i love my neighbor i will fight for my neighbor to be able to steal something yeah. so that it can be equitable yeah no yeah all right let's go on to the next one um t future orientation and time okay Planning for the future, delayed gratification, progress is always best, tomorrow will be better, and then following rigid time schedules, time viewed as a commodity. I have so many problems here. <laughs> well, you know. Oh, my word. Okay, let's talk about planning for the future. Planning for the future is, once again, a biblical value. Yes. <laughs> to leave a yes. legacy for your children is a virtue. Um, to, to not be in debt, to have delayed gratification. Oh, no, man. Anything aside from the debt of love. Yes. It, these are profoundly and deeply Judeo-Christian values. Uh, to say again that they are white, I think is to miss, miss the point. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. I think, um, when it comes to being on time. Yeah. How was that in Africa? Well, I just feel like that is a whole situation that we might need another video for <laughs> because there is, you know, definitely, you know, uh, how can I say it? You know, I feel like, you know, we sometimes different people groups run on different times. That's for sure. And I would say that some people like to really be on time. Other people fixing to do it they fixing to get there they fixing to get there okay so i feel like you know certain people i'm not gonna i'm not gonna give any grouping or anything like that but certain people i mean they never gonna be you just never late like it's always i'm gonna get there if you all if you get there on time if function start at one o'clock you get there at one o'clock you, you think you're 30 minutes late now if a function start at one o'clock let's say it's a wedding and I get there at 1.30. I know the bride not walking down the aisle till 2.30, 3 o'clock. Anyway, I'm fixing to get there. I'm going to come. I'll, I'll still be on time. I know that these are different value systems. We, we kind of see things differently. And I don't know why. Because I feel like when I, when I was in Africa, too, like, you know, we, we, we will start when we get there. <laughs> we will start and it's going to be okay. Ain't nobody about to die. Well, now now let late. me ask you now, if there was like money or food involved, and you everybody's going to be on time. Everybody's <laughs> going to be on time. Y'all ain't even going to lie. You offer me some money or food and I will be on time. Yes. Yes. The but money or be food. Good food. It, I mean, don't, don't contingent offer me on like a certain nothing. time that would people in Africa show up for that. Yes. Yes. But it has to be good food. And, and not like a, uh, like in South Africa, they call it a bry, a barbecue, you know, it, not, not that. Like, so but then I mean, it kind of just sounds like a, a cultural habit. It, it is like, you know, that could be broken. I could go against it. Yes. Because there, there really are like some, some black people I know personally who are always 10 minutes early to everything. They yeah. will never be late because they also don't want to adopt that mindset or pass that mindset onto their children yeah. of. You know, that it's okay what? to disrespect people's time. I think part of it comes down to how do you honor and respect someone else? Have you ever fired yeah. anyone for being chronically late to work? Why we got to talk about that publicly? Excuse us. <laughs> Why we got to talk about that publicly? Yes. Ha ha have you? You didn't yes. just chalk it up to, well, that's a different yes, culture. I may, have, I may have fired some people. 
Now, if that's a white value, are we not going to fire people of color if they're chronically late to work? Well, I think with this... What are what HR people, departments going to do? They got to be going crazy because I think <laughs> what's going to be coming gonna down work? the pike is, well, I'm black. I can't get to work on time. I know someone who's like that, who is just like, I get there. And, sh- and this person has literally trained every boss that she's worked with to the idea, not that she's black, so she can't get to work on time, but that she'll get there when she gets there. And I am just like, how do you do it? it it's so is firing a person who's habitually late, if they're a, a person of color, is, is that going to be like a racist issue? I think now? it will be. Wow. I think it will be eventually, yes. Okay. Just like, um, and we will talk about this more in the family meeting, but the idea of naps and how naps is reparation is coming around. Yeah, I think firing people who are habitually late because they're <laughs> Those black, of you who are HR yeah. directors, good luck out there. <laughs> that will that will soon become a thing of how can you fire me Teachers just for being late? Marking students tardy. Good luck. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go yeah. on to the next yes. thing. All right, all right. Aesthetics based on European culture, steak and potatoes bland is best. I don't know who uh-huh. wrote this. That's this. so wrong. Whoever did that, they wrong. I'm going to go ahead and put that out there. You wrong for that. Woman's beauty based on blonde and thin Barbies. Man's attractiveness based on economic status power. This yeah, well, so I don't know. Stereotype. I this mean, maybe so... I'm white because I do think a, a guy with economic status, power, and intellect is quite attractive. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. If you if you are the reverse of economic status, <laughs> Hi, power, I'm and poor. intellect. <laughs> Hi, I'm poor, but I'm a person of color. Will you marry me? Being well off is a no. is a no. white thing. You don't. Mm-mm, the devil is a lie. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, I will be the color of my shirt today. <laughs> yes, you cannot. I no. Mm-mm. Anyway, um, okay, so that's that's a whole thing. Like we talked about this with the Brady Bunch situation. Like there was a time in America yes. where I feel like Hollywood and a lot of people, whatever groups, whatever, said that this is the the standard and definition of well, beauty. We should explain. Like I've watched the Brady Bunch since I was a kid. You yes. know, 35, 40 years, and I never noticed. That all the children on the Brady Bunch have blue eyes. Except for Peter, I think. I think Peter's yeah. brown. But yes, and, and, everybody has blue eyes. And then Parents, she, Alice. Monique had never watched the Brady Bunch, really. And so when she came to live with us, we're watching the Brady Bunch. And she's like, one of the first things she notices is they all have blue eyes. I'm like, never noticed this. And she was, yeah. she said, well, that's the ideal. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? But... I that, think that was the ideal 40 years ago. That would be true. I don't think that that's a, a value anymore that we have. I don't think it's a value anymore. And especially not as things like black girl magic pop up and things like that. This idea that I need to be so thin, but I mean, what's wrong with being thin? Like the, what was the opposite obesity? Like, <laughs> can we just be healthy? Fat studies. Yeah. Like, but that's what it's going to come down to, you know, like so being thin is a white value. Yes. Going to CrossFit. Ooh. now see i don't know about crossing <laughs> that's some stuff that's i can't be doing value. that that wide i did that a couple of times thought i was gonna die yes what that's is a, this that's a some chains white, and stuff yeah no white stuff yeah mm, i'll play some tether ball and some double dutch but <laughs> yeah no being um, but yeah what would be the opposite of that like being obese is being obese having diabetes like but these are things that you regularly find i feel like within the black community <laughs> You know, like, and it's so sad, and it's not to talk bad about. Feel my, free to write to her. It's this all not her I mean, objections. But okay, so, this is horrible. I'm not trying to sound like that. That's that's not real. Um, well, it kind of is though. But these are things that, <laughs> like, I don't know how else to say it. Like, we, I wish that we, and I think we're getting better at as this. And when I say we, I mean black people. I think we're getting better at looking at our health. You know, for so long, part of, well, part of being in poverty means that you can only afford certain foods. Part of the problem with America is that you can use your EBT, which is electronic benefits transfer, or back in the old days, your food stamps to go to McDonald's. Why is it easier for me to use my 
my food stamps to go to McDonald's than it is for me to go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. Why can't I go and get the same healthy food for the $3 that I'm going to spend on this junk food over here? Sure. We have a problem in America, I feel like, regarding well, that's food a worthwhile and, conversation. and access to food. Yeah. You know, like you, you won't find, and th- there's many reasons, but you won't find a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods in a lot of inner city neighborhoods. Does that mean in every inner city? No, but in a lot, you don't find that. What you will find is food that's that's marked up higher in the inner city than what you will find in the suburb. Okay, so that's maybe a little bit of what so is behind that. It's a little bit of what's behind it. It's easier for me to go and get my kid a Hostess cupcake than it is for me to buy a bag of carrots. So we've never talked about this before, but it makes me wonder <clears throat> what the church could speak into in that in inner cities. Well, one you know, go ahead because sorry. <clears throat> to think about how God has designed our bodies, for example, and having like a rigorous theology of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Uh, My friend, Dr. Jim Painter, for example, travels all over the country. He's a Christian and has his PhD in in nutrition and giving like the latest scientific research on that of how our God has designed our bodies and how they should function. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm just wondering like, wow, maybe we need to really have a, almost like, for lack of a better term, like a justice conversation about health and nutrition. Yeah. And, well, and how, how providing edu- edu- education yeah. about or that. Or even, um, there's a, there's a, I feel like a, maybe they're a ministry. I don't know if they're just a nonprofit, but in Los Angeles that started a gardening project and people can go and get like low cost, fresh produce where you can go into a grocery store and one, I'm spoiled because I lived abroad for so long, but you know, our, our produce in America is just a mess, but you go into a, a grocery store in a lot of the inner cities and it's, it's horrible. It's way worse than what you would mm-hmm. find in the suburbs. And so I feel like these are other conversations. Yes. Um, diabetes and high blood pressure, hypertension, like all these things are real. And I think there's some reasoning behind that that yeah, we could have more sense. conversation about. But saying that being thin is white seems problematic to me. Yes, because being obese is death. Yeah. And so I'm like, what are my options? White or death? Like, <laughs> can I get something in the middle? Yeah. I don't know. All right. All right. Let's keep going here. Uh, aesthetics. All right. Yeah, we talked about that. Holidays based on Christian religions, white history, and male leaders. I don't. I don't. I don't know, because to me, that takes out Martin Luther King Day or yeah. Cesar Chavez. But, you know, we can keep going. Yeah. I just I feel like that's again. These are things that are just looking to separate the Judeo-Christian worldview from a critical race theory yeah. or a Marxist theory um, worldview. Just, now, let's go, go on to justice. justice. English common based on English common law, protect property. There's property again and entitlements. I don't know what that it's means. It's and intent. Oh, entitlement. Sorry, I was yeah, looking at it. Yeah, and in intent part. Intent counts. All right, so yes, our justice system is based on English common law. And if you dig deeper, it's based a lot on scripture. Mm. And so, I mean, you can just Google search, you know, law journals that have peer-reviewed articles based on Old Testament laws. I mean, there's a deep relationship between the Bible and our law system. Mm. And so to say it, it, it call English common um, justice ideas as being white, again, white is bad. White is wicked. Really what we're saying is the Judeo-Christian um, idea of biblical justice is wrong yeah. and wicked. So let's go back to that graphic again. Um, here again is protecting property rights. Yes, mm-hmm. because the Bible tells me so. Um, intent counts. Let's talk about all of this, uh, you know, because this, this intention is important when it comes to justice because intention is if I murder, there's different, for example, there's different levels of murder charges. If it's manslaughter, it's, well, my intent was not to kill him. It was an accident, yeah. you know, and versus first degree murder, which is premeditation. That's what it means by intent, mm-hmm. that your intent 
is part of the charging or the sentencing versus I can imagine the impact. Is that what they're going That's for? That's kind of what I was thinking, intent versus impact. Um, but I hold strongly to, you know, we are also responsible for our intent. Like, But like in the critical there, theory a, model, it's the impact is more important yes, than the intent. Yeah. Like, what is what is your impact? Um, well, that goes to, like... It, I'm thinking of like, well, you might not know you're a racist. Yeah, that's what I was thinking was microaggressions. Yeah. You know, and your intention doesn't matter. What matters is your impact. Well, what matters is my experience. Yeah. You know, and and that to me takes us back to that original point of like truth and objective truth and things like that. Yes. The impact. Yeah. Next. All right. How much longer is this? This, Yeah. This this is like. Okay. We in for the long haul. All right. We're almost there. Okay. Woo, buddy. (laughs) All right. Yeah, buddy, this is this is long. All right, competition. Be number one, win at all costs. Oh, brother. Winner loser dichotomy, action orientation, master and control nature must always do something about a situation. Aggressiveness and extroversion, decision making, majority rules. Well, so much stereotyping. I mean, there goes baseball. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no. I mean, like, basically, all competitive sports are white. Well, and I mean, <laughs> how does this set up a child who is just born naturally competitive? Like, like that's something that's just in their little DNA. You know, when when we what do you tell that, your nephews who are all in sports? Exactly, and especially <laughs> when this enters into the school system, and yeah. kids now are taught this. Now I'm participating in a way that's wicked. When it could just be that I am competitive. Now let's go back to that for a minute. Now you've told me stories before, where, you know, people have made comments about you being smart. You know that that's a white. That's a white well, thing. The way that I speak or um, yes, there is a especially now this rhetoric of, well, if you get good grades, then you're acting white. You know, if you when I was in. Um, so the like alternative group, is you're supposed to have success well, in the, life by not earning it. I, I don't understand what the alternative would be. Are you talking about in regards to speech or education or education? Yeah. Or co- competition, education. I guess the the goal would be a group process so that we all get there together as but how opposed do you, to how going do you, on your own. But how do you translate that into a career? Maybe you own a family business. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so confused right now. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it, I think I think it's the 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 idea that even like pooling money. So you get these group pools and everybody chips in so much money um a month and then you get yours and I get mine and she gets hers and but we all work together to better the pool and as we better the pool we all become better as a result. So rather than the meritocracy of I work hard and I earn my way and I compete and the best ideas rise to the top. It's I pool my money with other I think people. That's, I think that's one one way that I can see it. It's like, um, and I, I forgot that, like, there's a name for these pools. I forgot what it's called. But I think that's one way. But I don't. I also don't think that this is a white idea. And I don't think that black people are sitting around thinking, oh, this is a white idea. That's why I'm like, who came up with this? Because <laughs> if you go to any inner city, I feel like everybody's talking about, you know, what are you doing? Like, get your education. Teachers are encouraging students to get their education. Parents that are, you know, involved in their kids' lives are saying, what are you doing? Like, you can't just spend all day playing video games or, you know, being at the park or things like that. What are you get- What are you doing? Read a book. Um but what's the setup that you think is going to be created in the next generation if competition is seen as, well, that's acting white. You don't, you don't want to be white. You know, that's thinking white. If this gets fully into the education system and becomes something that's mandatorily taught, yes, that is going to be a problem because what do you do with competitive sports? What do you do with kids who are just naturally competitive? You How know, do like you do help? you shame them and say, well, now you're acting white? I don't know. I'm confused. I don't have no kids. See? Uh-uh. <laughs> All right. Mm. Last one. Here we go. Communication. The King's English rules. I don't know what that means. Mm. Oh, well. That's... Written tradition. Avoid conflict. 
intimacy. Don't show emotion. Don't dis- discuss your personal life. Be polite. So being polite is white. I don't. I I have nothing to say on that one. I'm, I'm not I'm, sure. I that this this what? is news to me. This is news to me. Now with the with the so, whole. So being rude is a virtue in the. What's the alternative there? I can just I think, act any any well, kind of crazy way. I think that it is. Maybe they shouldn't say polite. Maybe they're thinking like placating. As opposed to just being bold and telling you exactly what I think. Oh, okay. So it's not so much about like saying please and thank you. Like going to Chick-fil-A and they say my pleasure. Is that white? You, no, oh. it's it's the idea that I'm not going to let you know exactly what I'm thinking. Oh, this is I'm like what I call white nice. White nice. Yes. Where you, you just placate people and you don't want to cause conflict and, yes this uh, whole oh, okay. conflict avoid it let me just make good i and whereas yeah. the alternative is well i'm gonna just tell I'm gonna you let how, you know what i think i'm gonna tell you how, i said what i said i said what i said yeah. i right. said what i said all right and i think that there i mean there potentially could be something to that but i don't think that that is like all white people of all time participate this way. And I think that this is what this is showing. It's like, well, if you if you do this, then you're participating according to a wicked standard. Maybe you're participating according to James, you know, where you're being slow to speak. Maybe you're considering your words before you speak them. Maybe you're giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. Maybe that you're having self-control. Yeah, maybe you're having self-control, all of which I could grow in because I'm Peter and I'll just, <laughs> let's cut that ear off, Betty. I said what I said. All right. Um, So there it is. From the African-American Museum at the Smithsonian. White culture. You now know all the things about white culture. But we will not participate that way. That is one of the beauties and um, one of the reasons why I think it's important. And I'm glad that you, you know, said, hey, we should, you know, talk about this. Because we don't participate in culture according to culture's ideals and standards we don't participate according to culture's definitions yeah. um also like it says in second i think it's second corinthians 5 maybe it's first corinthians 5 16 new creation oh um yeah nope. so yeah but in in 5 16 it, it's either first or second i'm not the theologian y'all just pray for me um 5 16 it says that we should no longer regard each other according mm-hmm. to the worldly ways. And then it says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new, new creation. creation. Yeah. We don't regard each other according to these ways. One, they're just silly. Like, let's just own that. That's silly. This whole little, whoever spent the money and the time and the salary. They pay big money for that. Yeah, the the salary. The person who did this. I am like, their salary is probably large and fat. And <laughs> they made a silly, silly infographic. That really just seeks to separate and divide us even further. And this is why we don't participate in culture according to culture's demands. Um, You know, the whole idea of, you know, being polite is being white. I also, that makes me think of that meme that white silence is violence. Like, we don't participate like that. We don't participate according to that. We don't allow a hashtag to to make us move or a meme to make us move. You know, what this highlights for me, though, is how often they're associating white culture, which is wicked Mm -hmm. in their definition with Judeo Judeo Christian, Judeo Christian worldview. And so then technically what's wicked is the Judeo Christianity and what because that whiteness is going to slowly be removed so that people now associate Judeo Christian values with wickedness. Yeah. And we have to we have to be alert, first of all, as to what's really happening. And two, we have to be bold and be in the risk of not participating in those same in those same veins. Yeah, very much so. Well, we hope this helped you. All right. (laughs) Send us some feedback. Let us know what's up. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do any of this without you. And so thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye bye.